in the endocrine system, we have two different ways that hormones can get the job done. And it's going to depend on what kind of hormone it is, whether it's a water-soluble hormone, so basically a amino acid-based hormone, or whether it's a steroid, a fat-based hormone. So here let's talk about the amino acid-based, so the water-soluble hormones. And because they're water-soluble, and because they come up to a cell from the outside, they are not capable of going through the cell membrane. The cell membrane is made out of fat, and fat and water are not compatible with each other. So the hormone is going to, over here at step one, is going to attach to a receptor. And it's only going to attach to the specific receptor that is compatible to that particular protein. Meaning that particular hormone might be exposing itself to many different kinds of cells, but it will only attach to and only affect the particular cell that has that specific receptor for it. So in this case, we have the appropriate receptor, and then that triggers a chain reaction inside. And it's called a second messenger mechanism, and basically what happens is this little blue protein inside goes along the membrane and triggers some other reactions. And eventually, after that chain reaction completes, whatever the thing was that the hormone was supposed to stimulate finally happens. But there are multiple intermediate uh, steps in the process. One thing triggers the next, which triggers the next, which triggers the next, and eventually gets to where it needs to go and stimulates whatever enzyme or whatever secretion or whatever function that it was supposed to stimulate. If we look at a lipid-soluble hormone, so the steroid hormones, they are fat-based, and they can then diffuse through the cell membrane. Fat dissolves through fat. That hormone then goes directly into the cell and attaches to a receptor protein inside, which then goes to the DNA of the cell and directly cranks out the protein of whatever it was it was supposed to be. So the question here is, which one of these hormones will provide a more rapid response? A amino acid water-based hormone or a lipid soluble hormone? My answer would be that the lipid soluble hormone would trigger a response faster because it doesn't have to go through all those intermediate steps as part of that second messenger mechanism. It just goes right in, attaches, and does its thing. So it, uh, because it has fewer steps, it gets to where it needs to go a little bit quicker. Either one of those ways will get the job done. So it just depends as to what you're working with there. If we look at this table, there's a comparison between the water-soluble and the fat-soluble hormones. And so that's a good one just to take a look at it. And you can see that there are some differences definitely between them. And uh, again, you can read. I'm not going to insult your adult intelligence on this. But do take a look at this table. It's a good one. When we actually get into the endocrine glands, we always start at the top and work our way down. So everything comes from the brain, one way or the other. And in this particular case, the master control gland of the entire body is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is going to run everything from here on out in some form or fashion. But a key thing to understand here is that the endocrine system rarely goes directly from where the hormone is made to the tissue that it needs to impact to do its job. It's usually a multi-step process, so it's often made in one place and then sent somewhere else to be stored and then released from that place to have further effects. So here we start to see this. The hypothalamus makes oxytocin and it makes antidiuretic hormone. Now, oxytocin is relevant in stimulating uterine contractions for childbirth. It's also relevant in production of breast milk and letdown of that breast milk. Those would be reproductive functions, obviously. Antidiuretic hormone is going to regulate kidney urine production. So neither one of those functionalities are happening anywhere near the brain, but that's where it started with the production of the hormones. 
The hypothalamus then sends those two hormones to the posterior pituitary, where it is stored, and then it can later be released from that part of the pituitary gland into the blood when it's needed. The anterior pituitary works a little bit differently, so the posterior pituitary didn't make any hormones on its own. It just accepted what the hypothalamus made and released it when it was told to. The anterior pituitary gland, though, does make things, but it does take its orders from the hypothalamus. So when the hypothalamus releases um, some stimulatory or perhaps inhibitory hormones, that then triggers the anterior post, uh, pituitary gland to make what it makes. So it's going to make growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, luteinizing hormone, LH, and prolactin. And we saw FSH, LH, and prolactin when we talked about reproduction. So those are going to have some sort of impact on reproductive functionality. If we go through this table again, that sort of repeats what we just talked about here. So the posterior pituitary with the oxytocin and ADH. Growth hormone and the others. So thyroid stimulating hormone is going to be another one of those things where it was uh, the hypothalamus told the anterior pituitary to make it. The anterior pituitary made it, then released it, and that stimulated the thyroid. The thyroid then might produce thyroid hormone, which would go out into the body and affect other cells. So this is starting to become quite a large chain reaction. We went from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary to the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland to the rest of the body. So there's a five-step process right there just to get your metabolism and normal body function to occur. Endocrinologists, if they're good, have a very critically thinking brain that is able to keep track of all these different things, where they go, and what that stimulates next in the process. So it can become a very, very convoluted web of interactions all over the body, all of it triggered perhaps from one small little place. If we look at growth hormone specifically, it actually has a lot of functionalities. It obviously, as its name would suggest, would promote growth. So uh, it would increase skeletal cartilage formation and growth. That would improve uh, growth of bones. It would increase protein synthesis and cell growth and production. It would increase fat metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. So it's going to have growth effects, but also metabolic effects of enhancing metabolism functions. And that sort of makes sense. If you're growing, you need to enhance your metabolism to go along with it. If growth hormone levels get off, then uh, you can experience some significant problems. So here are three different examples, and they are all approximately, let's say, about 30 years old. The male on the left there suffers from what's known as pituitary dwarfism. And what happened here is the pituitary gland just didn't make enough growth hormone. So his body used what growth hormone it had to achieve what it could, but it just wasn't enough to achieve a normal height. The individual in the middle suffers from pituitary giganticism. I guess I should say suffered from pituitary giganticism. In that case, the pituitary gland made too much growth hormone. And so the body took the hormone and did what it was supposed to do with it, but it was just too much. The female on the right there is a, a normal-sized female, and so her pituitary gland uh, did with growth hormone what it should, and uh, then she achieved a normal size. So with this individual in the middle, there's going to be all kinds of health problems. 
that uh, fella probably didn't survive much more than about another five years after this picture was taken. If you look at those feet there, those are absolutely gigantic feet. And we'll look at a uh, picture of the feet of Robert Wadlow Jr. here in a little bit. And he was at one point the tallest person in the world. And his feet were just enormous, and you can't even begin to appreciate it until you see his shoes. So we'll take a look at his shoes here in a little bit, and you'll hopefully be able to appreciate that. These days, we do know what causes these sort of abnormalities, and we know what to do about it. So the individual suffering from dwarfism, we would simply give growth hormone supplements, and uh, he would then achieve normal height. The individual in the middle, we would actually get medication that would inhibit growth hormone release, and that would stop his growth at a perhaps a normal place. So if a child is expressing abnormal growth patterns, and you're going to the doctor like you should, they will catch that, and then they can test to see what the problem is. And if it's a pituitary hormone thing, then they can give medication that will help to fix that. Here's Robert Wadlow Jr. that I mentioned just a moment ago. And he is at this point about 21 years old in this picture. And the gentleman standing next to him is his father. And his father was a normal sized male. And so you can see there the significant difference. And Mr. Wadlow was just a fraction of an inch short of nine feet tall. So really, really tall fella here. And you can see at the bottom here a regular size 12 shoe on the left, and then Robert Wadlow's uh, shoe there to the right. So a huge difference there in that. So those were no doubt custom-made shoes. He was actually, for a short period of time, a shoe salesman. He actually died at the age of 22. So And at that point, he was still documented to have been growing. So he actually got an infection from one of his leg braces that rubbed on his leg and caused an open sore and infection. And about two weeks after that infection, he died. So if he hadn't died from that infection, he might have grown another, oh, I don't know, another four or five years and could have easily exceeded nine feet tall. So at that point, though, no doubt his heart wasn't in the greatest of shape because it would have been trying to support that huge mass of body. At that point, he was just a little shy of 500 pounds. So he wasn't necessarily anorexic at all. And you can see his hands also were quite large. So every part of the body was growing. Now, if you remember bone growth, we have said before that bone growth occurs until fusion occurs at the epiphyseal plate. So when the diaphysis and the epiphysis of a bone grow together, that's when vertical growth of that long bone stops. So for him, he was growing, and it was to the point where he normally probably would have stopped growing, but clearly his epiphyseal plates had not fused. So again, how long they would have continued to experience growth before fusion, who knows, but he was still actively growing at the age of 22. Now what happens to someone who continues to have abnormally high levels of growth hormone after the epiphyseal plates fuse. So you can no longer get proportional growth. What happens? And the answer is you still get growth, but it becomes distorted growth. So in the top left, we have a picture here of Andre the Giant. He was uh, known for being a very, very large person and not really an attractive person. This particular picture is one of the more attractive pictures you might find of him. He was also right around that 500 pound mark as well. So these individuals tend to be physically quite large across the board. But what you're seeing here is distorted growth of the face. So this happens most obviously in the face, but it's also going to happen in the hands, feet, and rest of the body to some degree, is you continue to grow, but it's not proportional growth. It's just adding bulk. So the face becomes distorted because the cheekbones and the jawbone, especially the mandible there, become quite overgrown. So you can see that Andre the Giant had a ginormous lower jaw, and his cheekbones were not necessarily doing him any favors. The gentleman on the right is Tony Robbins, and he is a motivational speaker. But if you see his bottom jaw there is really big, and that particular angle doesn't show so much, but his cheekbones are starting to get distorted as well. 
Now he's probably on some sort of medication to try to slow down the progression of that problem. But if you uh, actually pay attention to him when he talks, he talks a little bit with a kind of a, an unusual sounding pronunciation of words. And it just seems like his bottom jaw is kind of clumsy to move. And that's because it's experiencing that abnormal growth as well. A lot of these folks become actors and famous people because deep down inside, we all think we're good people, but that's really garbage. We're not good people at all. We're all full of biases and prejudices and all sorts of things. And the only thing that makes us different from other people who are truly bad people, perhaps, is what we do with those internal feelings. In the olden days, the idea of a circus freak show would have had the pituitary dwarf, would have had the pituitary giant. And if you found someone on here with this condition called acromegaly, then uh, they probably would have been there as some sort of ugly giant or something like that. And later in his life, after he quit wrestling, Andre the Giant actually became an actor and was the ogre giant in The Princess Bride, was probably his biggest movie claim to fame. He actually died of a heart attack relatively early in life, and partially that was probably because of his large body mass, and the heart just couldn't support it. The female we see at the bottom here is actually the same person in all three pictures, so that shows a progression of that problem. The first picture was around the age of 16, and at that point there wasn't really anything noticeably wrong. The second picture was at the age of 33, and you're starting to see some significant malformations occurring of the face. Definitely not progressing in a positive direction cosmetically. And then the third picture is at the age of 52. So at that point, the face has become grossly distorted. And you can see the hands there are absolutely huge. This is one of those sorts of things as well, that if we catch it early in the process, we can let things go to an appropriate point, And then with hormone manipulation, hopefully achieve some sort of happy balance with those kinds of problems. If we think about the thyroid gland and what it does, we can generically say the thyroid gland is responsible for your metabolism. So metabolism of glucose and protein and fat. We said growth hormone has something to do with that, but thyroid gland hormones probably are the greater contributor to regulating your metabolism. So as a younger person, you would experience the best metabolism that you'll probably have for your entire life. And we could say that means your thyroid gland is most effective at producing thyroid hormone and regulating your metabolism appropriately. What many of us find as we age is we get to a certain point, and it seems to really happen around the age of 30 for sure, maybe a little bit earlier if you're a female who's had children. But what happens is there's a change in metabolism in a negative direction as far as I'm concerned, and that is that you gain weight more quickly and you have a harder time losing it. So clearly your metabolism is slowing down. This is an example of that cascading events kind of idea we talked about earlier. With the hypothalamus producing thyroid releasing hormone, going to the anterior pituitary, which then releases thyroid stimulating hormone, going to the thyroid gland, which then produces thyroid hormones and affects most every cell in your body at some point. Here are a couple of things that the thyroid hormones do to the body. And you can go through this list, but you see the top couple things there are talking about metabolism how quickly you utilize calories, that sort of thing. And then it looks like cardiovascular, nervous system, muscular system, everything else, it's promoting normal function of that particular area. So it turns out that if your thyroid gland isn't working properly, you're going to have metabolism issues, but you're also going to have issues with every other part of the body because it's all involved in what thyroid hormone is promoting as normal function. We see here a person with a thyroid problem. This particular one happens to be an iodine deficiency goiter. So this person lives in, uh, I believe it is Burma, but in a country basically where the soil has no 
iodine. And then their food is very much deficient in iodine. So the thyroid gland really needs iodine because that's a critical ingredient in thyroid hormone. If your diet is deficient in iodine, your thyroid gland says, I can't make enough of this hormone properly because I don't have enough iodine. So I'm going to try to compensate for that by enlarging myself. So this person's thyroid gland is normally about the size of, uh, let's say, a large almond is now more like the size of a, let's say, a small orange. And so, again, the gland is trying to compensate for lack of function by simply getting bigger. Clearly, that's not going to do any good because you still don't have the nutrient that you need, but that's the natural response to deficiency. Ironically, this individual is probably one of the only documented types of problems in the world where McDonald's would actually improve her health. So if she were to eat McDonald's french fries, and this is why you don't typically see this sort of thing in the United States, because we typically eat lots and lots of salt. And most salt available to us is iodized salt. And that's the whole reason why salt has had iodine added to it, is so that we wouldn't experience this nutritional deficiency. And again, lots of us eat lots of salt, so that's not typically a problem. Unless you get into the sea salt or the salt substitutes that don't have iodine, and they have some other things that cause problems as well. So I would suggest just regular iodized salt, but don't get carried away with it. But if this lady were to consume, let's say, three cartons of McDonald's french fries per week for about two to three months, I would expect her thyroid to reduce itself back to relatively close to normal. And I'm guessing this is uncomfortable as well because it's going to be pre pressing on the esophagus and probably making you feel constantly like you've got a really big thyroid stuck in your throat. And it's going to be hard to swallow and things like that. So she would feel a lot better, and her metabolism and body function would be a lot better as well. After that couple of months, probably eating, uh, let's say, a large carton of fries once a month would probably do the trick for her for the rest of her life. The problem here is that no way could she afford McDonald's french fries. Even if they were much cheaper than they are in the United States, her annual income, annual income, might be around $5, maybe $10 for a year of uh, money left over after you survive. So probably wouldn't be able to afford it in the first place. A better solution might be iodine pills, and, so, and those would be a lot easier to distribute through the population. And it's a really a relatively affordable thing to do as well, but you have to have people in countries that can afford to do that sort of thing care enough to actually send the product to the places that it's needed, and probably the bigger challenge is getting it distributed once it's there. Here we see another kind of problem here, and that is uh, called Graves' disease. And what we would see in the uh, first example was a hypothyroidism where you didn't have enough function. This uh, particular problem here is Graves' disease would be a hyperthyroidism. So in this case, the thyroid gland is overactive. It's making too much of things and causing some problems that way. And so you're going to have what you see here as goiters behind the eyes. And both of these eyes seem to have a little bit of swelling behind them. But the person's left, so the eye on your right, is definitely sticking out more so than the eye on the left. And that's caused by a growth of um, tissue behind the eyes. It becomes very swollen and very fibrous, sort of like scar tissue in a way. And so it then causes the eyes to bulge out. Along with this, you might have uh, metabolic rate being off. You might have uh, heart rate regulation problems. You might have... Uh, perhaps being nervous and very, uh, I guess you could say, uh, wound up or anxious all the time. Uh, so the solution in that case is to remove the thyroid gland, either surgically or using radioactive iodine, or often both, and that will then eliminate the thyroid gland, and then these sorts of hormone imbalances 
will probably somewhat correct themselves. At least the symptoms would greatly reduce over time. One of the more famous people probably who had Graves' disease was Barbara Bush. So the wife of the first President Bush, George H. Bush, and she was First Lady in a time when the First Lady wasn't supposed to be a magazine model and wasn't supposed to be uh, a, a fashion statement. And so she had one eye that was bulging far more than the other, and she was a little on the plump side. And a reporter once asked her, said, do you have this problem? There are known solutions for it, so why don't you go get those solutions? And this was a time when political correctness wasn't that big of a deal either. And her response was, this is not an exact quote, but the general idea was, I am the way I am, and I'm okay with that. I've accepted that. If you're not okay with it, that's your problem, not mine, so you go get over yourself. Can you imagine what would happen if the First Lady of the United States were to say something like that today? It would be an absolute scandal, because this person who's supposed to be this magazine fashion model of perfection had the nerve to tell me to go jump off a cliff and mind my own business, and uh, that just really would go over probably not so well in the media these days. Located on the back of the thyroid gland is a number of small clumps of tissue collectively known as the parathyroid glands. The parathyroids are involved in calcium regulation in the blood. So if we look at blood calcium here, and if we see that blood calcium levels drop, then we would have an increase in parathyroid hormone release, which would increase the kidney's reabsorption of calcium from urine, would stimulate the activation of vitamin D, which would... Uh, help with calcium absorption from the intestines and it would increase osteoclast activity and if you recall from the chapter on bones in anatomy one osteoclasts are bone breakers so they would go into bones and remove calcium and dump that calcium into the bloodstream so if you increase calcium absorption in food increase calcium reabsorption from urine and increase calcium release from bones into the blood you will get an increase in calcium blood levels so the parathyroid glands are constantly either releasing or absorbing parathyroid hormone, which would then trigger, in this case, the kidneys and the bones to do something or not do something relative to blood calcium levels. If we talk about adrenal glands, adrenal glands are going to be found on top of the kidneys and they are going to be involved in a number of different things. In corticosteroids, in mineralocorticoids, in uh, glucocorticoids, and those are all steroids that are addressing your regulation of fluid, your salt regulation, and to a great degree your body's response to stress. So if you have a problem with the adrenal glands in this way, then you might have some issues. And here's what we see if there's too much glucocorticoid released. And uh, what's going to happen is, is that's going to influence cell metabolism and help us deal with stress by regulating blood glucose levels to some degree. But if there's too much, what you see is the person on the left becoming the person on the right. So you see some weight gain, and this would be somewhat similar to what would happen if you were to take steroids to treat, let's say, asthma or some other problem. But along the way, the steroids do enhance fat deposition in the body. So this individual has gained a little bit of weight. And then you see the buffalo hump on the back there. So some a pad of fat deposited on the back of the shoulder region. And, uh, and all that's coming from this problem. So if we go in and fix the problem, then within a reasonable amount of time, we would expect that that would go away. Those uh, pounds gained by both of fluid and fat dep deposition 
from the steroid levels would go away and we'd expect things to go roughly back to normal over a little bit of time. This particular problem is called Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. Addison's disease occurs when the adrenal glands don't uh, produce or release enough glucocorticoids and usually mineralocorticoids as well. So in that case, what's going to happen is you're going to have problems regulating fluid levels and uh, electrolyte levels in the body. You're going to see dehydration be perhaps a problem. And you're going to see a decreased ability to handle stress for the body. There's also often along with that a bronzing of the skin. And I don't have a picture of that because it's hard to find pictures from that time frame with color. But if we consider John F. Kennedy, one of the, the former presidents of the United States, he had Addison's disease. And what it did for him in a noticeable way was it made his skin sort of appear bronzed, like a almost a spray-on tan all the time. And perhaps that's what Marilyn Monroe and many, many other women found so attractive about him. But um, anyway, it, it caused that sort of exhibit uh, of symptoms. But from the stress handling perspective, when he was shot in the head in Dallas, and, and if you're buying into conspiracy theories, you would say that he's not really dead. He's just living with Elvis in Graceland or something like that. But when he was shot multiple times, there's no question about that those injuries probably would have been fatal to anybody. But they would have been even more fatal to JFK because of his inability to alter blood sugar levels, to alter um, electrolyte levels and keep things balanced. So his body would have been susceptible to failure much earlier or sooner under the same set of circumstances compared to someone with a properly functioning adrenal gland. As their name suggests, the adrenal glands also release adrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine, and that helps to respond to stressors as well. So if we look at stress, and stress is a horrible, horrible thing. I would propose that stress kills more people in the United States than any other cause, and perhaps more than lots of those causes put together. So in a short-term stressor, so right now you're experiencing a short-term stressor. For a couple of weeks, you're in this class, and we're doing it virtually. And it's a hard enough topic without the virtual disconnect anyway. So uh, you've got this stress. And in the short term, that's going to release adrenaline, which helps you get through that. And it's going to raise blood sugar levels. It's going to increase your heart rate and your blood pressure. And your metabolism is going to increase for a short period of time. Long-term stressors fall in the prolonged stress category. And what we see there is we see the breakdown of proteins and fats to get energy, which actually raises blood sugar levels, just like we saw earlier. But in this case, the blood sugar then gets turned right back around into fat again, and it really suppresses your metabolism. So short-term stress increases metabolic rate. Long-term stress actually decreases metabolic rate. It's also going to turn off the immune system, it's going to do bad things to the kidneys, to your blood pressure, and every kind of imaginable problem there. So, again, stress is one of those things you really want to avoid if possible. And there's no magic bullet for that. But what you can do with stress is one of two things. You can either avoid it, which is preferable because you never have the problems associated with it at all. You can eliminate it. Sometimes that's possible, sometimes that's not. Or you can minimize it. And so that's something you can always do something about a stressor is to what can you do to make it less of a stressor. Whether it's school or work or money or your job or your boss or your family or your dog or whatever your stressor happens to be, there's always something that can be done about that to minimize it. So if you can't avoid and you can't eliminate, and some of those things, by the way, you shouldn't try to eliminate. Uh, trying to eliminate children will get you in trouble. Uh, but you can always do something to minimize that. So if you can do that, that will take your stressors and put them more into the short-term stress 
than in the long-term stress category and will have fewer long-term negative effects on your health. At least we're going to hope. If we look at the pancreas, we think of the pancreas as regulating blood sugar, and that is part of its job. And uh, what we see here are some glucagon-producing cells and some insulin-producing cells. So actually the pancreas is involved in both raising and lowering blood sugar. The insulin-producing cells are going to produce insulin, which lowers blood sugar. The glucagon-producing cells produce glucagon, which raises blood sugar. So there are actually a couple of different ways that uh, blood sugar levels can rise. But really there's only one way that blood sugar levels can fall, and that's through insulin. So you can then ask yourself, which is more important? The ability to rapidly raise blood sugars or the ability to rapidly lower blood sugars? Which one is more likely to be immediately fatal? If you don't have enough sugar to power the, the emergency response, or if you have too much sugar? And the answer is that the ability to raise blood sugar is more important than the ability to lower it. If you don't raise blood sugar fast enough, you might not have the energy required to respond to a life-threatening scenario. You always have some time to lower it afterwards, though. So if you don't raise it, you might die, but there's time to lower it. Now, obviously, if it stays too high for a long period of time, that can eventually cause diabetes and be a cause of lots of problems up to, including the point of death. But um, both raising and lowering blood sugar is functionality of the pancreas. If the pancreas isn't working like it's supposed to, we most often notice that from the perspective of not able to lower blood sugar. So something wrong with insulin production, and then that can lead to diabetes. And diabetes mellitus, or perhaps we can refer that as uh, one of the two types, the other being diabetes insipidus. And then we talk about type 1 or type 2. And we would then say type 1 diabetes is something probably that you're born with. Type 2 diabetes is probably something that you have eaten your way into. So my father-in-law certainly had type 2 diabetes, and he suffered from it for almost probably 45 years. But uh, he very much in his younger life enjoyed all kinds of desserts. And working in Detroit, Michigan, he could tell you what time of the day any particular donut shop in town would have fresh donuts on the shelf. So he was quite a donut connoisseur. And that sort of diet of eating lots of donuts and other things that aren't good for you too led to him at a relatively young age being diagnosed with diabetes. And he would actually fall asleep in the middle of, of dinner at the table because his blood sugar would get off so much. So when he went to the doctor after a little while of this going on, the doctor told him, you can change your lifestyle and your diet right now. And if you don't, you're going to die in six months. That sort of guy's attention. And for most of the rest of his life, he was able to keep his diabetes within reasonable control just by diet. So being careful about what he ate, and if his blood sugar got a little high, he would just go exercise and that would take care of it. Not every diabetic is able to do that, but if you happen to be able to do that, do so. Because if you don't take care of yourself at that point, it will get worse to a point where you can't do anything about it just with exercise and diet regulation. And you might then become insulin dependent, and that's a problem in and of itself. If we look at that process of regulating blood sugar, here we can see that if blood goes up, the pancreas releases insulin, which will drop it back down. If blood sugar goes down, the pancreas part is going to release glucagon, which will raise it back up. So there's a constant adjustment of that process going on. There are a couple of other hormones produced in various places. Uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those sorts of things are produced in the testes and ovaries, and that's a result of... Um, the FSH and LH that we saw back at the hypothalamus and pituitary interactions. And so those obviously have some effects as well once they're activated. 
a couple of other things and places that uh, some hormones are produced. The kidneys produce urethropoietin, is probably the most significant of the others, and that's going to help regulate red blood cell count. So help to stimulate more red blood cells should you need them. Hopefully you learned a lot, and this all made some sort of sense. Have a good day, and we'll see you next time.